Coming up, the story of a song that has so many different urban legends behind it. Was this song written as a joke? Or was it written to test out a drum machine? I mean, the song doesn't even have a chorus. It was the biggest selling single ever in a certain format, but it was said to have lost money. And the theories behind the title of the song will make your head spin. It helps you if you have the co-writer of the song who was actually in the room when this was happening. Well, we just so happen to have a legendary instrumentalist and co-founding member of one of the pioneers of one of music's greatest movements. It's coming up on Professor of Rock, brought to you by Zenny Eyewear. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. We invite you to join our community below by subscribing for our daily content, and you can become a patron to help us curate this great history. Now, today we go behind a song that truly changed everything. Blue Monday by New Order. I mean, talk about a game changer. We've talked about it before that it should have been the number one hit. It was one of the key singles from that era that's influenced so much of what electronic music has become. I was extremely fortunate to sit down with one of the co-writers of that song, Peter Hook, the grandmaster bassist, whose distinct style of playing was really a defining aspect of those life-changing songs from Joy Division to the early and mid-period of New Order, he can tell you the rest. Here is Hooky with the story of Blue Monday. Blue Monday, biggest selling 12 inch single of all time. The title, always heard it came from Breakfast of Champions. No. Kurt Monaga. No, Steve said that. It didn't. It came yeah. from, um, I think it was Fats Waller. Yeah, or Fats Domino. Fats Domino, yeah. Um, Blue Monday. Blue Monday. I Blue Monday. I think, ridiculous as it may sound, I think I heard his song on Monday, Blue Monday. We were doing the track, we needed a title, and it came from that. And Steve came up with the Kurt Vonnegut Breakfast yeah. of Champions thing. <laughs> and I, I was like, Ugh. But I mean, you know, the weird thing is, is that one of the interesting things about writing the book is, is that if you put the three of us together, in a room, which doesn't happen often these days. <laughs> yeah. uh, certainly not without a boxing ring. Um, <laughs> the, we've all got completely different memories. Right. Yeah, theirs are wrong and mine are right. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning behind the song, there's so many urban legends about, well, it was about Ian, it was about the Falklands War, it was about Fats Domino. I think the craziest one is Rob Gretton. I heard him say something about that Fats Domino, it's a Blue Monday song, a lot of people in the 1950s, high school kids, committed suicide to that song. And Anyway, it's just interesting, all these different... None of them are true. <laughs> the Blue Monday was um, really originated quite selfishly by New Order in the fact that everybody was moaning at us for not playing encores. We were having loads of riots at the gigs uh, and it was actually becoming a problem. And so we came up with the idea of using the sequences to play while we went off and parted. And the idea was to write a sequence of tune that you'd press the button and it would play. And in our naivety <laughs> or our arrogance, we thought that that would satisfy the audience and we'd be free. Encores are very interesting. Uh, I'm actually enjoying not playing an encore again because we're doing the two Substance albums. We yeah. couldn't do it on the others. But we used to play, when we played Unknown Pleasure and Closer, it was nice to be able to come on and do Transmission, Love Will Tears Apart these days, as your encore. Because right. this album, this, those singles are on the album, the album, so it got out of it. But I did agree, and we all did agree, that in a very crude fashion, it would be like um, climaxing and then going back. It's not the same. It just wasn't good. It never felt good and we didn't like it. So the idea of Blue Monday originated to satisfy promoters who were all moaning because they were having riots at every gig. And strangely enough, by the time we'd got to finish it and I put the bass on, Bernard got an idea for a vocal off the bass and we finished it as a song. And then it was, ah, shit, now we'll have to do another one. <laughs> you know, because it stuck out again as being different from the album, but it was a song. You know, I never thought it was one of our greatest songs. 
I thought Thieves Like Us was a much better song. Great song. I was much happier with that, but Blue Monday, none of us realised that it would do what it did, neither did Factory. Well, and you talked about happy accidents in that song. Yes. Nowadays, you don't have that anymore because everybody tries to perfect everything. And well, you see, in that. those days when you recorded on tape, mm -hmm. you could not change it. And it, Blue Monday was so long that when we were adding up the bars, we kept getting it wrong and you just couldn't, it didn't read out yeah. the bar lengths. So those accidents that you hear, very luckily, with a combination of luck and talent, we managed to make sound correct in maybe a craft work fashion, actually, so that you have a lot of different bar lengths that would be considered to be wrong now. You know, you, you would not tolerate that with computers, and computers give you the, the ease yep. to fix it. Those days, you could not fix it. Once that tape was down, you could not change. You didn't have the time, you didn't have the money, and you didn't have the necessary equipment to do it. And if you listen to Power Corruption Lies, it has a lot of wrong yeah. bits where they're all different lengths, basically because we've miscounted and not noticed until you've come to put a vocal on. So usually, and wow. strangely in New Order, it was always the second verse that was shorter than the first. And if you look on a lot of the records, where we've miscounted is usually always in the same place. <laughs> but it does give them a unique feel and a, a unique sound. No and question. One of the pleasures of it, of playing the songs again as they are on the album. My gimmick is to play the songs as they are on the albums. Because what happened in New Order was, was that we got bored and we would change them all the time. And then when, I like to think that when Bernard got all the power, and he just stuck with the same set. You know, there, there was no variance that made it. It was a very frustrating time, yeah. actually. It was just a bit boring. But my gimmick is to go back to the albums and sort of uh, highlight the uniqueness that we had. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and people seem to appreciate it. You know, no I mean, I've watched some of the, um, the comments and the, uh, the expectations were not very high. And yet, you know, we've managed to tap into something courtesy of Bobby Gillespie from Primal Scream because it was him that gave me the inspiration to do it. Well, your first gig sold out in minutes. And the yeah, second I mean, gig... the, the first gig was 400 people, you know. I mean, it's strangely enough the same as it is tonight. But if you look at, like, we just played Mexico City, we did 5,000. We, we sold out in many gigs on this tour. I've been 1,500, 1,800. We, we're doing really well. My only guilt now is uh, not writing new music. I should be writing more <laughs> new music. But saying that, I've just had a hit record in France. Uh, I played bass with a group called the Illuminianas, and I had a hit, hit with it in France. Uh, I've also got a track that's gone up for Train Spotting 2 with uh, Rusty Egan out of the Rich Kids. Uh, I've also been asked this week to work with uh, Wolfgang Fleur out of Kraftwerk. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I'm getting my, my shots. You know, I'm getting the, the shots in the arm that keep you going, but I must admit that I am really enjoying playing the, our music. Well, really speaking am. of craft work, I always read that Blue Monday was influenced by four songs, and one of them was Uranium, the yes. long keyboard pad intro. Yeah. And then the bass part, is it true that Sylvester, you make me feel mighty real? Yep. And then... Drums with Donna Summer. Donna Summer, our love. Mm -hmm. And then the arrangement kind of dirty talk, right? Yes. The real talent and the real skill in writing music and using someone as an influence mm -hmm. is, is when it's hidden. You know, a new order were very, very good at taking influences, using them t as inspiration and then hiding them, you know, uh, whereas someone like The Cure wasn't. <laughs> In fact, The Cure, The Walk was, they were recording at the same time and they thought about pulling the release 
because it sounded very similar to Blue yeah, Monday. Yeah, I, I bet, yeah. But it was their yeah. biggest hit ever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Cure, the have the accolade as the only act that my mother has ever rang me up and said, they sound like you are, Peter. <laughs> In between days. You know, it's... it's it's, Things it's, happen. I take it as a compliment. Oh, I don't, yeah, it no question. But really. I always read that you guys didn't get a gold record because Factory was a member of VPI. That's correct. We did, <laughs> no, we, did, we didn't get about 30 gold records because yeah. Factory viewed the BPI as um, part of the work of the devil, which we were happy to go along with. <laughs> and yeah, we didn't get them until we got to London Records because yeah. they were uh, part of the BPI. Yeah. And... Quincy Jones, when you did the 88 version, mm -hmm. it recharted. Yeah. I mean, that just shows you the life of the song. And of course, Quincy Grand was fantastic. I mean, it was such a compliment to be, um, we presumed when we signed to Quest that he'd remix everything. He, he didn't do anything. We had to pressure him to do Blue Monday because he said, well, why do you want to do it? He said, you've done such a great job. Why would I want to do that? And we were going, oh, yeah. come on, please. You know, we want to do it for substance or whatever it was. Can't yeah. remember now. And, um, or the greatest hits, I think it was that. Uh, and yeah, we, we had to pressure him into doing it. He was such a lovely, lovely man. He, he always still, even now, I get a birthday card <laughs> and a Christmas card off Quincy Jones every year. And I never That's send awesome. him one, but he always sends me one and oh, uh, it always makes me smile, you know, whenever I get it. It's, uh, yeah, he's such a lovely, lovely, unaffected, genuine person. And, wow. you know, there aren't many, uh, sadly to say, in this business yeah. <laughs> that are as nice as, as he is. And I suppose we, we do have to thank Tom Atencio, our American manager, for introducing us and pulling off that deal, which was a very unusual deal, you know. It, I detailed it in the um, New Order book, was that we only signed for one record. Um, and the next record was on an option at our, wow. you know, um, bequest, quest, no pun intended. And yeah, it was a really unusual deal, but Quincy was one of the only ones that would go for it. Thank you for watching. Leave us a comment about this blazing electronic masterpiece. Share your memories of first hearing it or what is indelibly tied to it from your perspective. You can get the song and its incredible album cover below uh, with the original cover um, in our Amazon links. You can also get Hookie's book, Bernard Sumner's. If you like our content, join our community by subscribing to this channel below. Also, you can become an honorary patron to help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.